Can people injure their back from sex? Well, first thing, it's worth the risk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> But you know what's amazing? I don't think people get injured that often. I can't think of somebody who injured their back having sex. Probably because it's good for your back. Mm. It's probably a great exercise for your back, but I don't think it's that risky unless you're like in the extremes, obviously. But as soon as you feel comfortable, I encourage you just take it easy, 50% rule. And then they'll tell me, it's like, oh, good, because my other surgeon, I got another opinion, said, you know, three to six months. Yeah. And I thought, that's draconian. <laughs> Welcome back to the Rena Malik MD podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rena Malik. Today, our guest is Dr. Chol Kim. Dr. Chol Kim is an orthopedic surgeon, double board certified in orthopedic surgery as well as spine surgery, graduating from Harvard and having advanced training in spine surgery from Mayo Clinic. He is a well respected surgeon who's pioneering techniques in minimally invasive spine surgery. He is one of the few spine surgeons who will operate on pelvic dysthesias, including things like clitoral pain. Persistent general arousal syndrome, hard flaccid syndrome, and a variety of other very complex pelvic conditions that originate from inflammation or cysts in the spine. He's also published over 200 peer reviewed publications on minimally invasive spine surgery. Today, we talked about the anatomy of the spine, how you can prevent injury to the spine, and what to do if you are facing acute back injury and how to prevent it from becoming chronic. We talked about signs that you may need spine surgery. And also, we talked about ways to improve back pain through non surgical methods, as well as what signs you may see that be an indicator that you should proceed with spine surgery and when it becomes emergent. We also discussed the use of diagnostic injections to assess the potential success of any spine surgery. I hope you enjoy it. All right, Dr. Chol Kim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I'm so excited to have you because as you know, back pain is so, so common. Spine issues are so, so common. So I'm really excited to be covering this on the podcast. So let's start off with what is the basic anatomy of the spine? You brought me this wonderful spine model. So sort of what is, you know, what do we need to know and where are the issues that most often happen in the spine? So I brought a spine model, and it's a pretty good representation of the real thing in somebody that has a relatively normal spine with one herniated disc. And this is part of the spine that is called the lumbar spine. It's way down in your low back. And the key things about the spine that, um, that we always talk about in my office when I see patients is the disc. They're the shock absorbing bumpers between the bones called the vertebral bodies and the nerves that live inside there. And then there's also two little joints in the back called the facet joints. So a motion segment, like a knee joint is a motion segment, there just happens to be five in the lumbar spine. It's essentially like a tripod, a disc in the front that acts like a shock absorber and two little facet joints in the back that acts like this, like a tripod, the two little legs. And then in between lives all the nerves that's that's called the spinal canal and so even though there's it's a joint there's nerves running through it so it kind of makes the spine kind of a problem you could either have arthritis and just have arthritis pain or you can have a combination of arthritis pain and nerve pain or you can just have nerve pain and all these things kind of make uh, taking care of the spine a little challenging sometimes and in terms of nerve pain is it caused by bulging discs is it caused by disc dysfunction or is it caused by bony abnormalities or both good question anything that irritates the nerve somehow can cause the nerve to fire and give you things like sciatica and nerve pain the most common thing is a herniated disc it's like having a, a little pebble in your shoe irritating the nerve mechanically but That's not the only cause of nerve symptoms. Anything that kind of causes inflammation and nerve activation can cause it, like an annular tear in the disc, even though it's not mechanically compressing the nerve, all the inflammation that surrounds it will chemically irritate the nerve. Then as you get older, things happen where, like the treads on your tire, the discs wear out and collapse. And as that happens, the space for the canal just gets smaller. It's just geometry and you can develop things like spinal stenosis. And now you have nerve pain because you essentially have a tourniquet around the nerves. And these are the patients that when you go to Disneyland, there are the grandpas and grandmas that have to sit a lot because standing and walking is like having a tourniquet around your thigh. After a while, your legs get tired and weak and numb and tingly or a combination thereof, and you have to sit down. So I would say that that constitutes the majority of kind of 
problems related to the lumbar spine. And it's very common, unfortunately. And I think a lot of people see on their MRI results or their CT results, they may see some degenerative disc disease. Can you explain a little bit about what that is per se? Is that the same? Is that what causes the spinal stenosis or is there sort of um, a different mechanism? That's another strange thing about the spine. So here's what's weird. You can start developing degenerative changes that you see on x-ray and an MRI. That's essentially like the discs wearing out and osteophytes. You can even see bulging discs. You can even see some degree of stenosis. But turns out the majority of those patients are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So on top of the fact that you have this weird structure of joints stacked on top of each other with nerves running through it, for some reason, you can have all these weird degenerative changes, essentially the wearing out, like the treads on your tire, of the shock absorbing part of the disc, and the little cartilage in the back of the facet joints. And when that occurs in many other areas of the body, you have arthritis pain, but in the spine, many patients don't. So we have not figured out why on MRI and x-rays, things look essentially identically bad, but one patient has very little to no pain and other, someone else is debilitated. And that's one of these weird mysteries in spine that we're always grappling with. Do you think it's a limitation of imaging? Are we missing something? Like, I mean, we can't really see the nerves very well. I know there are sort of neurography, MRI neurography, which are more advanced MRI te techniques to look at nerves, but they're not perfect. And I think, um, is that, you think, an issue with the detail that we have in imaging? Yes, definitely. Because... Um, by the way, when we went from CT scans to MRIs, it was like a logarithmic leap in our understanding of anatomy. But we need one more of those leaps to understand why somebody has pain and why somebody doesn't, even though their imaging studies look virtually identical. This is a, a huge problem. I don't know if people are aware of it. Um, but my guess is, is that we're missing the kind of physiologic component of it because some arthritic discs or degenerated discs are kind of quiet and, and not irritated. Another degenerated disc is hot and the inflammatory process is markedly elevated. So my guess is, is that we don't have a very good way to determine what's an inflamed disc and non-inflamed disc. But that's probably coming down the pike. There's a new study that is kind of a combination of a bone scan and a CT scan. It's called the SPECT scan. Mm -hmm. And I posted a few things about it. But when you look at that, the areas that are markedly arthritic, they light up like really bright red. So it's really dramatic. And right now, that's like, you know, really basic tracer physiology technology. But once we get a little bit more sophisticated and we can like light up inflammatory markers that are for real, I bet you're going to be much better at diagnosing painful conditions versus non-painful conditions. Yeah, because SPECT has been around a long time. So is it more that we're using different tracers to identify inflammation? I think so. And I think we're configuring it somehow to look at the spine better. Well, that's really important. And I, I want to talk also, you mentioned annular tears. And I've, to my understanding, these are very, very common, but sometimes they can be ignored because they're so common. And we know that sometimes, obviously, there are symptoms associated with these annular tears. So let's talk about that a little bit. The annular tear problem is like one of those orphan drug problems. It is um, a very difficult problem to tackle, seemingly, because here's the situation. Most people with annular tears have no symptoms. But that's not the same thing as saying all patients with annular tears are asymptomatic because mm -hmm. clearly some people are. Uh, we just have to figure out which ones are symptomatic, which ones aren't. And again, imaging has not been helpful for that. We also tried using a technology called provocative discography, which I won't go into because we don't do that th that much anymore. But it's our way of trying to identify what looks bad on an MRI and see if it's actually painful. And this, this issue is really important because think about it. If you cannot figure out whether an abnormality is truly symptomatic, you end up doing surgery on abnormalities without knowing for sure that it's the cause of the pain. And in many of those cases, the patients aren't gonna get better. Mm -hmm. So I think our limitations in this kind of diagnostic ability is the reason why a lot of spine surgeries don't work. I mean, most still work, but it's the ones that don't work that people hear about. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And it's still a very, it's one of those high risk specialties where we still have a fairly significant failure rate. 
When was the last time a doctor spent an hour with you and truly focused on your goals? And when was the last time you left feeling like you really understood what was going on with your body and had a clear plan of what was going to happen next? At my practice, Rena Malik, MD, I aim to do just that. I specialize in sexual dysfunction, bladder health, hormone health, and pelvic pain for all people. And I want to revolutionize how we take care of patients. I want to really get to know each and every one of you. That's why at my practice, when you come to see me, I'm 100% present with you for an entire hour. And after you leave, if you forgot to ask me something or need clarification on something we talked about, don't worry. I'll respond to your issues and questions quickly through our secure messaging portal without any additional costs. Just go to www.renamalikmd.com slash appointments and schedule your visit today. We see patients in Irvine and Beverly Hills, California, and virtually for patients from California, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia. If you aren't located in these states, consider making an educational visit where we can talk about your conditions generally, but I can't diagnose or treat you. I can't wait to see you. So I want to get into that. I want to talk about when you see an abnormality and a patient comes in with pain. Like you just said, sometimes that abnormality is not actually the cause of the pain. So how do you determine as a patient or what do you tell your patients in terms of like, okay, they're going to have this surgery and it's sometimes it's more obvious than others, but what sort of things should patients look out for when they have chronic back pain and they find this abnormality that is sort of very common, how can how can they determine that their spine surgeon is actually sort of like really onto something? I'm really glad you brought that up. And it boils down to the following. <laughs> you have to ask the surgeon, you look them right in the eye like you're ordering steak or fish and you want to know <laughs> which, which you really order, you look them deep in the eye and you say, how confident are you that this is the location of the pain generator? And if they answer you with like, oh, the fish is just excellent tonight, right away, you know, you're going to get the fish. If they have to think about it, you have to question them more. So I would say that to be a really good surgeon, um, one of the key things is you have to be a really good detective Mm -hmm. because um, I would say that most surgeons are technically very skilled. What separates the highly successful surgeons from the non-successful surgeons is the nature of the problems that they treat as it relates to how accurate their diagnostic kind of acumen is. And some diseases are really easy to diagnose, others are very difficult. Low back pain, very, very, very difficult. A tumor or a fracture from falling off a building, very easy to diagnose. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, But unfortunately, most patients have the former type of problem. (laughs) Yeah. The ones that are difficult to diagnose. And annular tears are one of them. Let's talk about the causes of these abnormalities. I mean, some of them are due to age, but certainly some are due to repetitive motion injuries or other things. What are things people are doing that may be causing mo- them to be more likely to have back problems? And then what sort of things do you recommend as prevention when you're young and healthy to avoid those things? You said something really important best to start as soon as possible. Sort of like if you want to keep a car forever, you want to start taking care of it from day one. So the time to start is today. And I know it's hard because I've not started either, even though I have great plans too. (laughs) But the most important thing is to be really healthy and fit because one G of gravity on planet Earth is a lot more than you think. There's a reason why we use the term dead weight. You try to pick up 150 pounds, like a sack of rice, you'll be surprised how heavy it is. But I weigh about 150. Every time I stand up, I'm just throwing around that weight. And the discs, the facet joint cartilage are just like the treads on your tire. They're going to wear out. The question is how fast and what can be done to mitigate it. And my guess is, is that the most important thing you can do is to be really healthy and fit so that all the muscles that surround your spine are not only like strong, but more importantly, coordinated. So that Mm -hmm. as you just literally just bend over to get something, an incredible amount of pressure goes through your discs from all the weight that you're putting on it. And if the muscles are working in a way that redistributes all those loads across all the five discs, it'll probably last a lot longer than somebody that is really uncoordinated. And it's gonna basically find the weakest disc and then just keep going down that road. Yeah, so when you bend over to pick something up, like keep your back straight and use your lower extremities and sort of stuff. And use the muscles in a a way that um, redistributes the loads to do that. And the way to do that is to 
exercises that those muscles are used to it. So what are some good exercises that people can do, particularly uh, to strengthen the muscles around the spine? Everyone focuses on just strengthening the core and it's mostly the abdominals. But I found that that's not that helpful. What's more helpful is to help them find an activity that they enjoy doing <laughs> because this is like watering a plant. You have to water it on a regular basis you can't forget about it for three months and then expect it to do well. So that's that's what I really focus on, a customized exercise program. And you can tell how much work that requires. That requires a really good physical therapist to get inside the person's head, find out what they like and don't like, and then leverage that information to find an exercise program they can do on their own for like until they go to heaven. So if someone doesn't <laughs> and it's hard. If someone doesn't have access to a physical therapist or like specialized care, how can they sort of design their own program? Like what sort of exercises should they look for in terms of, is um, it just core strengthening and core meaning the whole core, not just abdominal? Is it back, chest and back? Like what sort of things should they focus on? What areas of the body? I'll tell you what I do for most of my stuff. And, mm -hmm. and when I want to do something, I hardly ever like go to classes or hire coaches. I just open up my phone, <laughs> start looking through social media and I find a lot of guides on um, all the different exercises. There's so many out there. I don't have any that are just popping to my mind, but there's a lot of really good exercise physiologists that can help you develop a program. But you know what I noticed? For most of us, what you need is you need like a little, I don't know, a buddy, somebody that you're kind of, it's like a consequence buddy. I can't remember what that's called, but. Accountability uh, buddy. Accountability buddy. Yeah. You need somebody that you need to find somebody that is kind of wanting to start getting fit and going down the same journey as you. And it can't be your spouse either. It has to be somebody <laughs> that if you kind of like let them down, you're going to feel bad about it. That's true. Because they will get you there. But it, I will say that my husband and I go to the gym together and lift weights together. It's actually fun for us to do together as a couple. You lucky so, devil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so sometimes you can incorporate your spouse, but yes, I can definitely say, no, I don't want to today and make him go alone <laughs> and I won't feel bad about it. See, that's what I'm saying. He's yeah. got to leave the house and make you feel so guilty. You're just going to say, I'm coming, forget it. Yeah, exactly. Cause once you get there, it's amazing. You'll get a good workout. You just got to walk in the door. That's the hardest thing. What about that's injuring what yourself working out? Because we see that, right? Especially people who do a lot of body, uh, a lot of weightlifting, or even a large amount of endurance exercising, they can injure themselves. So, how can you protect yourself when you're doing the thing that you should do to help your spine health overall? That's one of those questions that I have no answer for because you're just going to get injured intermittently. Probably the best thing to do is to have either a coach or an, or a partner that can objectively see what you're doing and if you're overdoing it, kind of hold you back because it's really hard to self-regulate. Since I'm not very good at that, I keep a journal. Mm -hmm. So just keeping track of the activities that you do because sometimes you may overdo something and not realize it for two or three days and, real and think like, I don't even know why this is happening because a lot of my patients will start a really good exercise program or a good PT program. They'll have a flare up and they'll conclude that PT is bad for you and just completely stop mm -hmm. instead of trying to identify what part of that PT was probably not right for them, backing up and regrouping and keeping on with the with this journey of finding this kind of perfect program for yourself because it has to be customized, I noticed. There's no single program that works for everybody. And backing up in terms of like listening to your body pains and saying, okay, I should stop for a few days, a week till the pain goes away. Like how do you, or, or going back on the amount of time or the weight amount that you're lifting if you're lifting weights. Yep. Oh, by the way, I tell my patients all the time, if the little voice inside your head says something about this is not right, I want them to listen to it. And I even want them to tell their therapists and their coaches like, I don't know what it is about this, but something doesn't feel right about it. Dr. Kim told me to tell you, say that. Yeah. So I don't know why, but that's pretty important. So I would listen to that. But um, in terms of trying to avoid injuries, you almost have to get injured every once in a while to figure out what injures you because I'm a big believer in trying to constantly get better. Because right. one of the other weird things is that the body gets used to a certain exercise. So if you do the same exercise, all the time after a while it's not that helpful anymore mm -hmm. you know like i do 50 push-ups every night i don't think it's helping me anymore i need to do something different because <laughs> i probably my body's somehow gotten used to it yeah or change it. the way you're doing push-ups yeah something. and it's like really yeah. efficient now yeah so it doesn't really help me 
Yeah, that's a good, good advice. I will just share a story. So I developed a labral tear in my hip and I, um, and it was quite painful for some time, but I was still able to ambulate and do my normal activities. But I did, you know, slowly, I, I backed off on the, the exercises that would really strain that joint. And then as the pain got better, I started to do them at lower weights. And now the pain is almost completely gone. Uh, it rarely flares up. Um, because I think I've strengthened the muscles around the joint there. And so I think that's good, uh, a good advice in terms of like, yeah, take it, take it easy. Like, okay, it's okay if you have to stop a certain exercise, like it's not the end of the world. You can do other things to continue to strengthen uh, and slowly build back up. Yep. I mean, if, if I had to just recommend one like kind of parameter is to back up 50% of what you were doing mm -hmm. uh, until, and then just go up 10% per week. Mm -hmm. And you keep track. For some people, it'll just be 10% per week. Some people will be like, I want to do 20% next week. And some people it has to be 10, 20, and then five. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately, it's so different. I, everyone that I, all my patients just want like, give me a number. It's like, well, I can give you a number, but it's probably not going to be accurate. If you keep track, that number will be your number. And that's the number that we yeah. want to go after. And By the way, I'm a big believer in the future of healthcare has to be customized like, absolutely including our blood tests and things like that yeah i think um it's interesting we had andy galpin on the podcast and he's like you know when you look at our normal values their standard deviation of two you know two or whatever so you can be from 10 percent to 90 percent and be in the normal range but that may not be optimal for you and i think it's really important to sort of assess what works for you will not work for everybody else. And trusting your own body as a guide is really yeah. valuable. Yeah, I think when we have like kind of continuous monitoring, that'll be make it that'll make it a lot easier because then you can use your own history. And if you can then enter information like I had a really good day today, I felt really run down and you just start gathering up all that data just on yourself, just through history, I bet you're going to have information that is much more pertinent to you. You don't have yeah. to wait until you're really sick. I think it's good. I think sometimes it leads to unnecessary anxiety, continuous monitoring. Like you might see a blip in something, <laughs> right? I can see and, that. You, and you're like, oh my God, my, like this went off today. And now my whole, like, oh, what does that mean? And spending a lot of energy and anxiety on that one thing. I think generally looking at how you overall feel, knowing that there's going to be aberrations day to day, your hormones change day to day, your whole body changes day to day, depending on the stress you're exposed to and the, and, and the sunlight you're exposed to and the, like everything, right? Like how well you sleep yeah. the night before. So I think, um, there's so many factors and to figure out what exactly you, so my, right. you know minutia you need to change is going to be very difficult and probably at the end of it sleeping well getting good exercise um, staying hydrated like the basic things will always remain true to yep. improve your health so in terms of you know acute pain acute back pain is very very common like you get injured something All happens the time. but the good news is at least to my knowledge is that very small percentage of people with acute back pain go on to have chronic back pain and i think we've talked on you know what can you do in the short term in terms of pulling it back but are there other things you can do uh, diet wise supplement wise when you're in the situation of having an acute episode of pain the number one thing is being really healthy and fit where the muscles that surround your spine acts like the world's greatest back brace. So they're both strong and coordinated. And then the rest has to do with being really healthy in general. And if there's one thing, it has to do with the inflammatory system. Mm -hmm. I would say that most Americans, including me, were all in a heightened state of inflammation relative to the way we probably were 20,000 years ago. And it's because of our lifestyle. We don't exercise enough. We don't sleep properly. Mm -hmm. We eat really highly inflammatory food we don't fast enough and then i think twenty thousand years ago we're we basically evolved to like go from periods of terror and mm -hmm. then sheer relief we didn't have this kind of low never ending kind of i have to work on my thesis or build up my career that is just constant mm -hmm. without these because the the great thing about today is that we don't ever get terrified that the saber-toothed tiger is going to jump out and eat us but we need that i think the people that are like these extreme athletes they they have to live like that because they kind of are in that that end of the spectrum but i think all of us are normally designed to have terror relief terror relief not this low level of stress so this low level of stress sleep deprivation and a highly inflammatory diet in the setting of of lack of exercise 
a lot of the disorders that we have, I think the chronic ones are inflammatory. And my thinking is, is that patients that have an annular tear um, that are symptomatic are simply those patients that have that episode of back pain for like two weeks, they have an annular tear, but that annular tear kind of heals. Mm -hmm. And when you get an MRI a year later, it still looks like an annular tear, but it's asymptomatic. But the group of patients that remain symptomatic with chronic low back pain, the inflammatory system has never turned off. It's just chronically on. And if you're wondering, I wonder if that happens in other areas of the body. If you've ever had tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, plantar fasciitis, shin splints, IT band syndrome, rotator cuff tendonitis, those are all chronic inflammatory conditions where the, the, the inflammatory state is just stuck on the on position and they are painful. Yeah. <laughs> I've had most of them and they last forever. And if you image them, you can hardly tell something's wrong. And the surgeries to treat them are really just to go in there and muck things up and essentially start a new healing reaction so that hopefully this time around it'll go down the correct path. But this whole inflammatory system, I think, contributes to higher incidence of chronic low back pain, and chronic neck pain and joint pain and a variety of other things. So how do we, outside of sleeping well, getting good exercise, eating right, what else can we do to reduce our inflammation? I think you said all, there's five things. So there's exercise, um, good sleep, good nutrition, stress management, and what is the fifth thing? That's a lot, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that, so that, this is why it's so hard. I mean, those are really difficult problems to, to tackle. Yeah. What about, we hear a lot about yoga and back pain. How does yoga specifically as an exercise benefit people with back pain or prevention of back pain for that matter? Yoga is awesome because it's an exercise where you don't put yourself at risk for injury that much compared mm -hmm. to like, kickboxing which is what i like there's stretching involved and there's meditation involved the problem is like i couldn't do yoga myself i would i could like you could i couldn't do it <laughs> it, it seems too boring or too awkward or doesn't fit my image i don't know what it is but like like my wife does this hot yoga my pa does this hot yoga i have zero interest in it yeah so part of it is is um the best exercise is the exercise that you actually enjoy doing. And then you take that activity and you kind of like make it kind of safe. Yeah. And then add into it cross training activities so that you can get better and better and better without injuring yourself. Yeah. That's yeah. The, that's the most common message that I try to get across to my patients. That's good. You mentioned fasting. How do you think fasting helps? I'm not sure, but my wife is a vegan and she has like time restricted eating and she's really healthy. And I've been making fun of her for like 30, 40 years, <laughs> but the last five years, she's doing the mic drop all the time because she, that, now it's paying dividends. In now. terms of like no aches, no pains, that sort of yes, stuff. Yes, healthy yeah. skin, never gets a cavity, never catches a cold. So you think that there's some benefit in terms of reducing inflammation for fasting? Oh, yes. So fasting and a low inflammatory diet, I think is, if I had to guess, the second most important thing to do. Exercise followed by our diet. And what would you avoid for a low inflammatory diet? The most inflammatory things are mammalian proteins. So my favorite, a big fat juicy steak. <laughs> <laughs> it is terrible for you. Yeah. But I can't help it or, or, or a good burger. So cheese, these are all my favorite foods. Red meat, I'm not a big dairy product person, but a lot of people love dairy. Mm -hmm. Those are all the worst things you can eat. Despite yeah. what everybody says, but it's true. I, I know a lot of the, the, carniv so the carnivore diet people are going to come after us, but I, yeah, you know, sorry. there's there's a lot of data there. Um, <laughs> so feel free to cut that out. <laughs> no, we'll keep it. <laughs> um, so, in terms of you know, people getting injured and needing surgery, what are the signs that you might need surgery? And what do you tell your patients? Like, when is it time to actually consider some sort of surgical intervention? Very good question. So um, the kind of the most basic general rule, again, is to look the surgeon deep in the eye and go, would you do this surgery if I were you? You're my beloved family member. So that's the first thing. And they have to answer like without looking away or thinking about it. There's kind of two gen general categories. There's elective surgery and emergent surgery. The emergent surgery is generally easy. 
it's like you have to have the surgery and if you ask the question to a surgeon what would you do if you were me they would quickly answer whatever the answer that they gave you yeah. it's emergency surgery but the majority of spine surgeries are elective surgeries to treat pain mm -hmm. some of them are to treat neurologic deficits but the majority the main concern is pain so the question is at what point is pain bad enough to warrant the risk of spine surgery because i do a lot of surgeries as minimal invasively as possible but it's still risky yeah <laughs> it's like formula one car racing you're going to crash every once in a while it's just it's too many variables but i do two things the first thing i do is i try very hard to get a diagnosis in the process of trying to get them better without surgery i do that about 15 times more than i do surgery i see about 15 patients for every one surgery so i spend most of my time with non-operative treatment and one thing that i started doing and i hope more people will do it is use targeted diagnostic injections you know like when you go to the dentist and you get mm -hmm. that numbing medicine yeah when they numb up that cavity the pain goes away so i really rely on targeted injections and i have to coach very carefully <laughs> the patients to kind of pay attention to their symptoms and be able to tell me like an experiment what their symptoms were like before the injection including like maneuvers to make it worse get the injection and then don't don't go home and just go to sleep like go back to the same Do place and, try to, things, yeah. and then see if you get better and if you get a lot better then and i have the location of the anatomic site my surgical success rate is like 80 to 90 percent if i do the surgery in the in a setting where i can do a diagnostic injection the diagnostic injection is negative and for one reason or another it doesn't happen very often it's like there's nothing else we have to do it that success rate is only 40 percent mm. so you can just see like I don't recommend the surgery. If we did it under these circumstances, we have a forty percent success rate. Most yeah. patients will say, "Forget it." And so, not not every not every abnormality can be treated with a diagnostic injection, though. Right, right. but so many can. Many Most can. can actually for the ones that are talking about pain. And so when you do that, you also ask, like, "What was your life like during that period when you're feeling well? Did it make a big difference?" Mm -hmm. And if they say, "Oh my God, I could do this for the first time in a long time without pain. I felt so much better." You immediately get a sense that if you can make the patient kind of like that forever they're gonna have a very good result right. and then you ask yourself okay based on everything that i know what would i do if this is my beloved family member and usually the right answer comes out you have yeah. to be very strong though and, <laughs> and then really it, ask yourself those difficult questions it's important it's important I, I tell people all the time i think the best surgeons are the ones that know when not to operate right because surgery any procedure no matter how minor has a risk with it and if you're the one who has that risk it doesn't matter if it's 0.1 percent risk yes you have that problem and you're living with it yep. and um, we've all been there where we've done things and they've had an unintended outcome right and it's not great and you feel bad about it because you made the wrong decision so um in terms of neurologic sequelae what are the most common neurologic sequelae that people will notice when they develop pain uh, when they from their back pain or back injuries and how can they know when it's getting like really sort of to the point where oh my god this is this is a sign that maybe you need to have surgery sooner rather than later those are easy too so that's a that's a group of patients that may have like motor weakness like a drop foot that's the most common thing and when somebody has a drop foot they cannot lift their foot up off the ground as they walk mm -hmm. so they'll catch their toe a lot or they have to lift their knee way up to clear their toe and it's a clear abnormal gait that's the, probably the most common problem that we see when you get a herniated disc and it pinches one of the nerves usually the l5 nerve mm -hmm. a lot of people call that sciatica um, but that motor weakness when you develop that roughly if it doesn't get better within six to twelve weeks it's best to do surgery and mm -hmm. that's another one where you ask the surgeon what would you do they'd be like oh i'd do surgery that's clear mm -hmm. um, so a neurologic weakness that affects your function yeah. you walk in funny you're catching your toe that's a dysfunction if it's mild you don't even notice it i notice it and the demands are low there may be times where you just decide you're going to just live with it if, especially if it's not painful mm -hmm. but i would say most people are concerned about pain their it, weakness is not as distressing surprisingly and i would say as a urologist we see patients who have caught equina syndrome sometimes um so urinary incontinence bowel incontinence and new onset back pain from a lower injury and that's not something to ignore that should be treated uh, and seen and assessed immediately by the way um you know one of the reasons why i know about you is that the other orphan problem in spine is our understanding of pelvic problems mm -hmm. sexual problems urinary problems and rectal problems 
due to a spine abnormality. So um, <laughs> I used to be one of those surgeons eight years ago, but that's probably another important message that we need to get across that there's a small group of patients that are part of this, what I call the orphan disease in spine, where they have like subtle pelvic symptoms. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to sexual function, which is a really complicated process, I'm starting to find out, it doesn't take much to discombobulate it. And my patients with a sexual disorder are so much more like miserable than my spine patients. And spine patients are considered pretty miserable patients to begin with. They don't hold a candle to my pelvic dysesthesia patients. It is really distressing. Yeah. So, I mean, we know now, and we didn't know this like maybe 10 years ago even, right? I think it was just really in its infancy that um, spine abnormalities can result in sort of these very um, significant sexual dysfunctions like persistent genital arousal syndrome, where you have a, a sensation of arousal all the time, but it doesn't really go away. It's actually very uncomfortable. And people actually get so distressed that they commit suicide. It can be associated with orgasmic disorders, with pelvic pain disorders, and with erectile slash uh, sort of hard flaccid sort of syndrome, those sorts of things where we look for spine pathology. Now, the issue I have as a urologist is one, the person reading the MRI may not notice something or may think of it as an unimportant finding. And two, there's very few surgeons who will operate on it, you being one of the few. So why do you think it is that people are ignoring these things? It's a combination of humans are funny, funny animals and um, the culture in medicine, and especially among surgeons. So um, the only reason why I know about this is that one of the pioneers, one of the masters, one of the most world-renowned sexual medicine surgeons just happens to be on the same campus as me. Yeah. And I've That's been Dr. On, Goldstein, yes, Dr. Irwin Goldstein. Yes, Dr. Irwin Goldstein. He's in the, <laughs> I mean, he's on the on a Netflix show um, that you should check out called um, You Are What You Eat. Mm -hmm. That talks about the anti-inflammatory diet and its effect on sexual function. But um, I've been at this institution for 15 years. I've known Erwin Goldstein for 15 years. I mean, everyone knows who he is. And for seven years, he had to badger me about this relationship between his patients with sexual dysfunction and what he thinks is due to a spinal problem. And I said the same thing that virtually all the all my colleagues, whom I adore and respect, they just say something to the effect of, I've never heard of such a thing. Okay, time to go. And don't even want to think about it. Mm -hmm. So it took him seven years until he finally came to my office, waited until my clinic was done, which ran an hour and a half late. This is like a famous, one of the most famous urologists in the world, just waiting in my office with a stack of MRIs. So we sat down and we went through all these MRIs to look for, at that time, Tarloff cysts, mm -hmm. but also noticed all oh, these patients have annular tears, herniated discs. And I said to him, well, the problem is, is that, you know, most of these are probably asymptomatic. And he looked at me and said, how can you figure it out? And we decided, why don't we try targeted injections? And in patients that have like hypersensitivity disorders, either pain or hyperorgasmia, we thought if you numb up that pain signal temporarily with something like Marcaine, if they got temporarily better, that would convince me that maybe that's the cause of the symptoms. And guess what happened? We okay. started doing injections and some of the patients had a marked diagnostic response. And then we started doing surgery on those things. And they're some of my happiest patients now. Yeah. I mean, the success rate of those patients are dramatic compared to a lot of my spine patients. Um, and I try very hard, just like my pelvic dysesthesia patients, to get an accurate diagnosis of my spine patients. But I think part of it is, is that they start out so distressed that when they get better, they're unbelievably happy. Yeah. So um, I just got to figure out a way to get this message across to my colleagues because we're a very resistant bunch. We do not like new information. Well, we don't surgeons, like change. Are, surgeons are technicians by nature, right? And so we tend to do what we know, we do it well. And um, there's only a small subset of us who I think are interested in innovation in the way of like being the leaders in that space people will follow innovators but they won't necessarily be the first and so that's sort of the challenge i think in that one there's obviously a lot of risk in doing surgery on patients 
even when patient and I think there's a lot of counseling that goes into it and a lot of people who um, are stuck by the insurance model don't have the kind of time to counsel patients extensively on the risks of these sorts of things you know and so that's where I think part of our healthcare system remains broken right like you and I probably spend I mean I know I spend like an hour with my patients talking to them about things but that's not a luxury that everyone has it has been very difficult a mm -hmm. lot of my colleagues they do twice as many surgeries and they see see two or three times as many patients per day and I can't keep up. Yeah. I mean, some of my patients are really complicated and it takes a lot of time to figure out what their problem is because to me, that's the key. <laughs> you have to get a good diagnosis to get a good surgical result. And yeah. I don't, I only remember my patients that don't do well. <laughs> yeah. I can't sleep at night. So I, from a selfish perspective, I do not like doing surgeries that don't work. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about in terms of other things people do for back pain. Um, and I, I'll share a story. So I had a patient, um, you know, there's a lot of use of chiropractors and sort of um, alternative methods for back pain. I don't think they're all bad, but I will say I've had some horror stories in my clinic. I had a patient who had a spine adjustment by a chiropractor and then developed stuttering priapism, which means that they started getting erections that lasted for longer than four hours and would go away and would come back periodically. Um, and we had to sort of work through that. Ultimately, he did get better. But you know, that sort of scares me that these sorts, there are these sort of unintended consequences. So what are your thoughts on chiropractic manipulation of the spine? And um, is it safe? I would, I love chiropractors. I think most chiropractors are safe. It's probably like any other specialty, there's going to be some scary people out there. Mm -hmm. Spine surgery has a lot more complications. So at least in San Diego, we have so many good chiropractors that I see very little bad consequences. I can't even think of something like that happening. So overall, as a field, I think the chiropractic community is very helpful. Um, it serves a really important need for my patients. And it's a good like complement to physical therapy. So physical therapy is what I call active non operative treatment. Chiropractic care is kind of more like passive, you show up and the chiropractor does stuff to you. Yeah. And overall, it's very safe. It's very rare that they're going to paralyze you. Yeah. But if somebody wanted to, and they're careless, you can do it. But I would say that um, I encourage patients to try chiropractors. Good. Just make sure that they're good chiropractors. Right. So get a good referral, look up reviews, that sort of stuff. Exactly. What about other things like acupuncture, other alternative methods for pain? I love acupuncture too. Yeah. I don't understand how it works, but it is uh, very, very safe. And um, I have a lot, number of patients that do well. So here's how I look at it. When you implement a treatment, you want to take into account like the likelihood that it'll work, but at the same time, you want to take into account the likelihood that you're going to have something bad happen. So surgery is one of those things like the likelihood that it'll work is very high, but guess what else is high? The risk. Because mm -hmm. if something bad happens, it can be bad. Whereas chiropractic care and acupuncture it may not be as foolproof, but the risk profile is much lower. So as long as the benefits outweigh the potential risks, um, I encourage it. And again, humans have this great need to be nurtured and chiropractic care and acupuncture is a passive modality. If you don't, I often find if you don't include that component of it, it doesn't work as well as getting people to like do all the work mm -hmm. for, with the passive modalities. You have to do both. That's really interesting. I've not thought of it that way, but that is nice to, yeah, to have someone do something to you rather than all the onus falling on you. Yep. Recently, I guess Sylvester Stallone had an injury from being body slammed on the expendables and uh he had to have seven back surgeries i did not know that so how common is that uh is that something that often happens where you need multiple relatively speaking relative to other surgeries it's very very common oh gosh <laughs> um but imagine you had five knee joints in one in your legs and one of the knee joints went bad mm -hmm. but you still have four other knee joints that's going to eventually go bad the the incidence of having more than one knee surgery goes up. Mm -hmm. So the spine has about 30 joints. In the lumbar spine, there's, you know, five big ones. Three of them are the most, three or four of them the most common. So it's kind of like having four knee joints. So when you take that into account, and the fact that there's nerves in there, so the nerves add in another reason to have to do something, I don't think it's that much. Um, but I can certainly tell you we can do better. And I, first, from a selfish standpoint, I'll give you one example. The most common surgery that's performed in the lumbar spine is a, like a midline open laminectomy and um, instrumented fusion. Mm 
Mm-hmm. That's kind of traditional open surgery. That's what I got trained in 20-something years ago. But since then, there's a huge field called mental invasive spine surgery, including mental invasive fusion surgery, that achieves all the same goals, but avoids injuring the muscles above and below the fusion so that you don't have a problem with adjacent level degeneration. Mm-hmm. So you think, okay, when would that start it? Well, the Society for Mental Invasive Spine Surgery was started in 2008. That's not even the first society, but that's kind of like the big one. 2008, that's like, what's the math? 16 years ago. Not that long ago. To me, that seems like forever. <laughs> so you'd think when you can show the benefits, almost everyone would be doing mental invasive surgery. But that's not the case. Like everything else, it takes years. It's still probably only 10, 15, 20% of surgeons routinely do lumbar fusions mental invasively. So the question is like, how can we get people to like see these benefits and what is the obstacle to adoption? Yeah, that is actually interesting that because we started deal. robotic surgery in the early 2000s in urology and now it's like ubiquitous. Everyone does it, right? Um, for prostatectomy, even for cystectomy. Um, I do it for prolapse surgery or reconstructive surgeries. It's interesting actually now that you say it like that. Um, I know you train people for minimally invasive surgery. Yes. Do you think that there's not enough training in residency programs? Do you think that's the issue? Or do you think it's just that people are sort of stubborn in their, and stuck in their ways? It's probably a combination of both. But a significant portion is humans hate change. Mm-hmm. And they're stuck in their ways. And it's really hard to, to go from something that you're really comfortable with, where you kind of know what to expect, and it's predictable, and then enter this period where it is kind of unclear. Yeah. Because when you switch over, it's sort of like being an expert skier, then starting to snowboard. There's going to be a period of a learning curve where you're going to kind of suck. And that is a really difficult problem. And we talk about the learning curve all the time. You know what's funny? We, here's how we talk about the learning curve. Oh, that learning curve is very difficult. I heard. Okay, next topic. Yeah. It's weird. We never ask, like, why is the learning curve so difficult? What can we do about the learning curve to make it easier and like study it as a problem in and of itself? But it's weird that that didn't happen. I'm curious to know what happened with true robotic surgery, like the Da Vinci robot. How did that occur? Yeah. Well, I'm not up on the literature in terms of learning curve, but I will say that there have been a lot of studies that I've seen in urology where they've looked at, like, for example, one of the things you do during a prostatectomy is you, after you remove the prostate, you connect the bladder to the urethra. And they've actually looked at how you throw the stitches for the anastomosis for each stitch, which hand you use, which the way you put your needle to optimize that and publish that. And then if you train that way, you're going to reduce the learning curve. So I think there is some work on on this but again there have to be people who want to do the work on minimally invasive spine surgery right and so how, lo- how long was the period where there just like 10 percent of people doing it before you know it when i i don't know the exact place. years but when i started training robotic surgery was relatively new there was still some people in the country that were really adamant that open surgery was better for you know but they were starting to get really well adopted that was in to think back like 2006 so you know it was still but very quickly people adopted it realized that it was better for the patient their recovery was better their outcomes were better and so i think it was very clear that it was a better operation in terms of bladder surgery that took a little bit longer one because it's a much longer operation so it's much more challenging to do that for six eight hours robotically and struggle for through something for that long when you're first learning and then as you get better you can identify the people who are really sort of into sort of improvements like really looking at the small motions that make improvements and then publishing that data presenting that data putting it on youtube in fact a lot of residents will learn about surgical technique through youtube even though we have societies and papers that publish it it's like they still go to youtube first so i would encourage any surgeon listening like record your surgeries if you're doing something that's working and put it on youtube and i know you do that Um, i am amazed at how many surgeons come up to me and tell me about the videos that I make. It's really important. And I look at YouTube for all the other stuff that I do, like changing the battery on my car remote control. <laughs> right, right. So, it's I so mean, easy. I think there is there's room. I, I think in general, urology is a is known for attracting a certain type of person. Like they're usually engineers. They're usually very innovative because we use lasers. We do all sorts of like very innovative things. And if you think about it, even in the space of prostate like enlargement there's since i've trained which was not that long ago there have been 
at least three, four, five new techniques to treat prostate enlargement. At least That's five amazing. that I can think of off the top of my head. And so, you know, people are always trying to innovate and make what we already have. You better. are so right. Urology is like always at the forefront. Guess what the first knee scope was? It was a cystoscope. Really? Yep. I didn't so know that. So a Japanese orthopedic surgeon took a cystoscope and stuck it in the knee, and that was the first reported use of knee arthroscopy. Fascinating. And then you guys started using the laser. So one of the surgeries that I do is an endoscopic discectomy and, and annuloplasty using the laser. And my colleagues think I'm like crazy or like, like uh, just hyping it up for no reason. And I have to remind them, listen, this is commonplace. Your face, your eyes, your gall, your your kidney stones. I mean, your prostate. The laser is used in multiple other areas of medicine. Why we don't think we could use it in the spine is mind-boggling. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, even as we use a lot of the um, the way you guys do implants, knee implants. You guys are so high volume in knee hip implant r r implants that we use a lot of that data for our penile implants to avoid infection. So I think there's a lot that of learning that can happen from. Um, other disciplines but yeah i think it is a different type of person generally speaking that goes into urology versus yep. orthopedic surgery it's taking a long time in spine that that tipping point it's not like it's it's been 20 years yeah. so it's probably going to be another five before it really almost because at some point everyone has to do the surgeries minimal invasively so let's talk about sex a little bit let's talk about first before we get into sort of the more complex stuff let's talk about can people injure their back from sex? There's a lot of lumbar strain, depending on the sort of movements you're using. Have you seen that? And how can people prevent that? Well, first thing, it's worth the risk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But you know what's amazing? I don't think people get injured that often. Because well, I'm just, good. I've been in practice for 20 years and I get to know my patients pretty well. And I'm sitting here thinking, I can't think of somebody who injured their back having sex. Probably because it's good for your back. Mm. It's probably a great exercise for your back, but I don't think it's that risky unless you're like in the extremes, obviously, but well, it's probably good, good for you. Continue having sex. Yes. That's great. That's the take home message. Well, I think that's, it's always good advice. <laughs> but in terms of- I have of a lot of colleagues that tell their patients not to have sex for like an extended period of time after a surgery. Mm -hmm. And so I get asked uh, sometimes and I say, as soon as you feel comfortable, I encourage you, just take it easy, 50% rule um and then they'll tell me it's like oh good because my other surgeon i got another opinion said you know three to six months yeah and i thought that's draconian <laughs> and i've you, never had a problem that is really good my husband uh he practiced in p physical medicine rehabilitation and they their motto is sort of normal function leads to normal recovery They're totally i think that right. applies for sex too you yeah. know you got to move so let's talk about that after spine surgery what can people expect in terms of recovery of walking ambulating moving and how much they push themselves kind of depends on the magnitude of the surgery but i would say the vast majority of surgeries if done using contemporary techniques whether it's a really good open technique or a really good middle invasive technique you should be able to be walking right away whether it's the neck or the back. Most patients only stay in the hospital for one midnight, so one night, uh, unless it's a multi-level surgery. But again, that's uncommon. And I like the rule of letting pain be your guide. Mm. Because what I noticed is that my patients that you know are like the punks, they won't listen. I tell them not to do something, they immediately do it like my teenage kids. <laughs> During the first month, they'll torture me and their family members a little bit more. But at three and six months, they're a light year ahead of my nervous Nelly patients, that even though I tell them the braces for comfort, I don't believe in the BLT, no bending, lifting, or twisting. Hmm. I like people to bend it, but just do it with control. But the nervous Nelly patients that show up at the Suixi visit with their brace on, and then ask me like, when can I start bending, twisting, and turning? I go, ugh. I told you you can do that right away. But they probably they looked online. They probably looked online and it said don't exactly. bend, lift, or twist. Or yeah. somebody standing in line at the grocery store happened to say, "Oh, you should." Didn't your surgeon tell you about the BLTs? And then they listen. And then at three and six months, they're still kind of like struggling a little bit compared to my crazy patients. So it's a little scary, and people don't like. They want to be told exactly what to do, but I try really hard to be strong and say, "Let pain be your guide. If you need to, keep a diary, and if you need to, we'll have an appointment every week." Rather have you do that and just get an excellent result now that I 
toiled away in your back and your neck mm -hmm. and it's worth it to me so uh, let pain be your guide everything gradual be a grown-up look at this as like you know a project like at work and, you, and simplest things just keep a journal so that you don't just all of a sudden go from zero to 100 miles an hour and get a bad flare-up yeah You're gradually ramping up and expect some days to be two or three steps forward and one step back some days mm -hmm. five steps forward and one step back you know kind of up and down but a general increase i think that's probably a good rule for most surgeries probably you know um getting back to normal function is important and helpful uh, you know we do abdominal surgeries and sometimes people can have a delayed return of bowel function so they may have feeling bloated or not pass gas right away and the best thing we tell them is to sit in a chair walk move around yep. and so you know getting out of the bed get moving as best you can as much as you feel comfortable is super important and what i tell patients is move do as much as you can but don't do so much that you're going to be lying in bed the next day because it hurts so much so again using your body as a guide taking it slow but continuing to advance and move forward is important any other sort of post-operative things they can do to maximize their outcomes surround yourself with friends and family mm -hmm. use this opportunity to encourage people to visit i notice a lot of people don't like people around but we need each other mm -hmm. especially when you're sick and you don't even, the people don't have to even do anything. They just have to be sitting there knowing that if something bad happened, they got your back. So I really like getting to know the patient's families and I really encourage them to like take care of them and encourage them to contact me directly if they have a problem. So that's probably the most important thing. And that's why patients that have really strong social support, they do, you know, an order of magnitude better than people that have really stressful home situations. Almost, yeah. unless it's urgent or emergent, I even generally recommend that those patients hold off on surgery. Yeah. That's how important that is. That's that's really under talked about or under discussed and I think so so important because you know your brain is so powerful in in terms of your recovery and your brain feels better when you're not lonely when you're around people when you're having interactions with them and we know loneliness and lack of social interactions are actually a big cause of mortality and yep. so overall just a big cause of negative consequences negative brain health which then affects your recovery yep all like right, we can talk so, about this whole Tarloff cyst story. I know. And let's say, <laughs> so let's talk about. I could just talk to you for forever. You're I so know. easy to talk oh, to. Oh, thank you. Um, let's let's get into this sort of pelvic dysthesias. Tell me about sort of you know what you found, what you you guys, you and Dr. Golson have researched um, and found, and in terms of outcomes and results in these patients who've had these variety of issues. Let me start from the beginning. So way back in 2012, a neurophysiologist from Rutgers by the name of Barry Komizorak, mm -hmm. who's taking care of patients with sexual disorders, in particular with a disease uh, called PGAD, mm -hmm. hyperorgasmic disorder. And he was looking at their pelvic MRIs, and he and his radiologist noticed that there's an unusually large number of patients in this small group with Tarlaf cysts, like over half of them. Mm. So he published that paper with the hypothesis that the tarlopsis must be causing this sexual medicine problem. Mm -hmm. And I didn't notice it, but guess who noticed it? Erwin Goldstein, <laughs> the most well-known, most thoughtful, um, is, has started many areas of sexual medicine. He's a urologist, and he just happens to be on campus with me. He saw that paper and immediately concluded the same thing. And I've known him for 15 years. We've been at the same institution. We started our sexual me spine sexual medicine program eight years ago. So for seven years, he's been badgering me about <laughs> this, or like four years, as soon as he found out. And all that time, I did the same thing as all my colleagues are doing. And in, in any sexual medicine experts, I've probably had this experience where they suspected it was a neurological problem. You send the patient to a neurologist, neurosurgeon, or spine surgeon, and they come back with the patient in tears that that surgeon basically ridiculed them. Mm -hmm. I was that surgeon because I was ignorant too, but eventually Dr. Goldstein came to my office, waited till I finished clinic, and we went through a big stack of MRIs, and he asked me, do you think that these could be causing your symptoms? And I said, I don't think so, <laughs> but we could find out by doing targeted diagnostic injections. And as we started doing them, some of the patients got temporarily better. Now, these patients 
have a problem not only with spine surgeons, but with many other doctors. Many of the patients that have really distressing sexual disorders, they've seen multiple doctors mm -hmm. and they've tried multiple treatments and, and they've had this problem getting worse and worse and worse for years. So when they have a positive diagnostic response, it's kind of crazy because it's the first time they may like see this light at the end of the tunnel. So we identified these patients, you know, some of them had a negative diagnostic response, but the ones that are positive response, we did surgery on. And mm -hmm. we did two surgeries predominantly, which is not that important, but uh, both minimal invasive. The disc surgery, where I used a laser endoscope, and Tarlaf cyst surgery before the Tarlaf cyst got bigger. Again, identifying the ones that we think are symptomatic using targeted injections. And guess what happened? They got better. They got better. So like, what percentage of people first got better with the diagnostic injection based on your data? And then what percentage of those people who were positive and had surgery got better? So I, I think what you're asking is like, how many patients do we start with? A yeah. lot. Yes. And we probably get down. And this is already screened. So these are patients that have sexual dysfunction and have seen somebody like Erwin Goldstein or you. Mm -hmm. And they worked them up and they said, we can't think of anything else. We've ruled out pudental neuralgia. We've ruled out all the other disorders that can contribute, hormonal disorders, even you know psychological contributors. And it's been boiled down to like, okay, we can only think of the spine. Mm -hmm. We got an MRI. Can you look at it? So we take, I think last check was like 1,500 MRIs, and we've done about 200 surgeries. But we look at the MRIs, and we look for a problem that could reasonably be, be treated. So some patients have no problem. <laughs> it's right. like a normal spine. That's not that common, actually. Many patients have a horrible looking spine where you're just like, I don't even know what to treat. And this treatment would be so risky. Because there's too many They're problems. not a candidate. Yeah. And then we filtered all down to like patients with herniated discs, annular tears, and relatively small tarlap cysts. And then we do targeted injections with those patients after we kind of talk to them and figure out that's the next thing. And we coach them very carefully to monitor their symptoms so that it's diagnostic. Mm -hmm. And if it's a positive diagnostic response, then we do surgery. And then after surgery, you know, we look at a bunch of stuff, but one of the simple things that I look at is a questionnaire that I give to a patient, and they just simply have to say, on a scale from one to seven, we call that a seven point Likert scale, mm -hmm. where, and this is validated. I'm very much better, that's an excellent result. Mm -hmm. Two is much better, that's also an excellent result. Three is somewhat better, that's also a good result because the somewhat better patients, they're ecstatic too, I noticed. Yeah. Four is no change, and then five, six, and seven is getting worse. Right. And I do this for everything. I administer that questionnaire after every injection, after every visit, after every surgery, and that's how I measure my success rate. That combined with no complications, no reoperations, and um, I would consider like a new symptom a complication. Right. Um, like introducing somebody to urinary incontinence with Tarlaf cyst surgery. That's my greatest fear. Mm -hmm. Turns out, if you do the surgery when it's not too late, that risk is relatively low. <laughs> mm. But if you wait too long, like waiting until they're starting to have urinary symptoms, then you do big Tarlaf cyst surgery, the likelihood that they'll get worse is much higher because they're more vulnerable. So we're learning a lot about um, you know, what causes what and you know, how to do the surgery so that we minimize complications and maximize results. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I am surprised at how well these patients are doing. Why do people get Tarlov cysts? What is it? No one really knows what the, like, the pathophysiology is, but I suspect there's a genetic component because there's a slightly higher incidence of this thing that we call durolactasias, which includes uh, the family of Tarlov cysts, and patients with collagen disorders. Mm. Ehlers Danlos syndrome is the most common. Really? So yeah. there's, and then, you know, there's some patients that are really flexible. You're probably one that can hyperextend your elbow. There's people that can push their thumb down to their mm -hmm. forearm. Mm -hmm. I call that generalized ligamentous hyperlaxity, and they tend to rupture their ACLs. So I suspect those patients are more likely to get Tarlov cysts, durolactasias, probably more likely to get arthritis, uh, more likely to get disc degeneration. You know, mm. they have valve problems and stuff like that. And then there's just kind of bad luck. So a Tarlaf cyst is something weird. It's made because the spine has this membrane called the dural tube or the membrane that holds in the spinal fluid and all the nerve rootlets. Mm -hmm. And this membrane is really thin, but for some reason or another, there's an area that either weakens or gets stressed and it starts to bulge out. Like when I was a little kid, I had this basketball 
that had this little area of wear that was more than everywhere else. And, and little by little, this thing, like this little <laughs> bubble would come out. It's like a diverticulum. It gets bigger. <laughs> yeah, it's like a diverticulum. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger because nerves need so much energy that like the brain and mm -hmm. the spinal fluid and the dural tube pulsates. Because that's how much blood is going there. It's, kind of, it's very that. creepy. So a lot of my surgeries, I'll be doing surgery and I'll say, let's wait for the pulsations to confirm that I've done an adequate decompression. Mm -hmm. And it's like got veins in there. And it's like pulsating. It's kind of scary. But that pulsation combined with some probably collagen disorder and some bad luck makes it bigger and bigger and bigger. And that pulsation will rot into the bone because bone remodels relative to stress. Yeah. The body's an amazing thing, by the way. Every time it I really describe it, I'm just like, how does that happen? Here's what's weird. The vast majority of these bulges and cystic formations and protuberances uh, and diverticula of the uh, dural membrane are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. But again, that's not the same thing as saying they're all asymptomatic because some are. And again, by using targeted diagnostic injections, we've been able to identify, because you can't do it any other way. It's like, I can't tell if that's symptomatic or not. But if you do a target diagnostic injection in a group of patients that will respond to that numbing agent, um, the success rate is very high. In fact, it's high. It's the highest out of all my surgeries. And it's the surgery that I'm the most scared about yeah. because it has such a scary reputation. But um, like everything, once you do it a lot, you get better at it too. But the Tarloff cyst is probably the most orphan of all disorders because yeah. it's very common. For some reason or another, most surgeons don't like doing that surgery. So there's just a few. I don't like doing that surgery either. <laughs> but there's now just a few surgeons that really specialize in it. But most surgeons really don't like doing that surgery. Yeah. And so that leaves that group of patients kind of abandoned. I will say that I have seen a, and again, I'm biased because people come to me with urinary problems. Um, but I have seen a handful of patients, more than a handful, probably over the, over the, over my lifetime, people who developed really bad bladder dysfunction after spine surgery. And it's not that it happens immediately, it's sort of progressive over time. They may have had surgery 10 years ago. And so a lot of them will say like, no one ever told me this could happen. And I think because it's so rare, it's not something that's commonly counseled on, but what is your take on that? That is a very rare, but real complication. Mm -hmm. It's gonna happen. I would say that when it comes to majority of spine surgeries that I do, which are elective, the severe complication rate is 1%. Mm -hmm. I do 200 cases a year. That means every year, two patients have a severe complication. Yeah. And one of them is like worsening urinary function. Yeah. So that happens like once a year. But it does happen. And so and if you've had spine so surgery. It is so distressing. It is. It is. And if you've had spine surgery and your urinary symptoms are bad, see a urologist. Because I will tell you, I have been surprised where someone comes in, their symptoms sound like pretty straightforward urgent contents. They got to go, got to go, can't make it, and they leak. Or they're just leaking all the time, right? And they don't really know what's causing it. I'll do a test called a urodynamics test where we put a catheter in the bladder. We assess for the pressure in the bladder. The, pre the bladder is normally like a balloon and it expands like a balloon. And so the pressure is pretty stable. But when you've developed really bad consequences of any sort of neurologic injury to the spine, potentially, your bladder can become more stiff. And then that pressure builds up and it actually goes back up and the kidneys and can create problems yep. and so i will say it's very rare but i do this test and i will find it and it's shocking to me and the patient but fortunately there are things we can do to help them that's treat really good them. to know but i will say that it's really important it may be negative right this test may be negative but it to identify it early before you get kidney failure before you get other issues or just to improve your leakage right because Most in definitely. those patients will know that you know medications may work they may not be as successful so i can tell the patient look we'll start with the easiest thing but you may need botox in the bladder you may need additional things uh, but it's a good thing to sort of assess early on so the patient knows this is serious this is a real problem we cannot just ignore this and say this is just leakage now this is rare i don't want to freak people out but i think just to know that this could happen i've seen it enough times to say that you should be thoughtful that's really good to know because that rare complication is severe too because it tends not to get better Mm -hmm. There is another very common complication, uh, urinary complication after spine surgery, especially in older men <laughs> where they get uh, urinary retention, but right. it's temporary. It's yes. a combination of their big prostates. 
So those are the patients that have to get up in the middle of the night to pee two or three times. Um, that's very common. Refuse, refuse to say why, how, how I know that, but I just do. <laughs> um, and they have surgery. So the trauma of surgery, um, along with all the medications from surgery, as well as especially pain medications, mm -hmm. aggravates that problem. So and I have a large- And and maybe yep. having a catheter, all those things. That is very common, but luckily yeah. um, temporary. Yes, yes. That's not much to worry about. Yes, and, and also if you have a, an initial insult to your spine, sometimes you have urinary incontinence or like, you know, or, or difficulty urinating depending, um, and it's usually temporary, and, and that right. gets better. But you should get evaluated afterwards to make sure yep. um, that you don't have any lasting problems to your bladder. We end the podcast with a few questions that I ask everybody. Yeah. Um, uh -oh. So <laughs> what do you know now that you wish you learned earlier in life? How general do you want me to be? It can be whatever you feel like sharing. Probably the biggest thing, and this is kind of sad because you'd think I would have figured this out a long time ago since I'm like 59. <laughs> I've been around for a while. But I'm surprised at how powerful one's feelings are in terms of how people make decisions. You know, I'll often be in clinic and try to convince somebody through sheer logic and reason why they should do something. You know, most common thing is exercise and be healthy. Mm -hmm. And they will understand everything, but they will not be able to do it. Because what will drive their day to day decision making is how they feel about whatever it is that they're going to do. So that's why I now focus on things like accountability partners and shame and FOMO and peer pressure. <laughs> because <works>. that, <laughs> that feeling is a lot more powerful than rational reason. I wish I knew that a long time ago. Uh, I think same thing with the power of social media. I mean, people learn things um, that are interesting to them. And things are interesting when they feel a certain way, not it's hardly ever like a piece of information that you just go, wow, that's brilliant information. We want to learn through like how we feel about new information, how it impacts us and things like that. So if I knew that, I would have been able to take over the world by now, but I think it's gonna take me another 20 or 30 years, but I'll be too old by then, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I think boat. the most effective people are the ones that can can um, create emotion in people, right? Yes. Um, and that's tough to do, right? Uh, what is a non-negotiable that you have to do every day? I have to do 50 push-ups before I go to sleep at night. Now, this is weird, I read a really I read a lot of self-help books because I need a lot of work. Um, but one of, <laughs> <We my favorite, laughs> one of my favorite books is Atomic Habits. I love and that book. So one of my Atomic Habits that really stuck is, for some reason, I have to do 50 push-ups before I go to sleep, like every day. And it's keyed in with like shame and FOMO. I tell everybody that I do 50 push-ups every day. So you know what happens now? If I go to bed and I forgot to do my 50 push-ups, even if I say to myself, I'll just do it in the morning, I cannot get to sleep. I have wow. to get up and I have to do those 50 push-ups. So from a day-to-day -day standpoint, that one little example of how powerful a habit is and how you make it a habit kind of is starting to drive all my little incremental other habits. Yeah. <laughs> because one of my non other general non-negotiables, and this is probably more of a pathology or a sickness than anything else, but nothing's ever good enough for me when it comes to my work. It's like I every time something happens, the first thing that thinks that pops into my mind is how can I? That's great, but how can I do it better? Mm -hmm. And I drive everyone around me crazy because they think I'm unhappy because I can, you know, I can compliment them twenty times, but the one time I go on and on about how this could be better, that's all they remember, mm -hmm. and it's exhausting. <laughs> on the one hand, it's kind of like my my area of pride, and I, whether I want to or not, I cannot break that habit. So. I, if I had to pick those two non-negotiables, I'm sure there's many others in no specific order. Those are the two that come to mind. <laughs> those are good, those are good. Um, what's one thing that you would wish would change in the world? I wish humans would think less with their feelings. Hmm. Goes back to your other thing, <laughs> yeah. More with logic and reason. <laughs> because I am just stupefied at the state of affairs of this world. And it all has to do with, we just have to, grapple with the fact that um, humans don't do things based on reason, logic, sometimes mm -hmm. what's necessarily right or wrong. Yeah. Fear mongering is powerful. It is powerful. Being um, part of a tribe is powerful. Mm -hmm. Being accepted is powerful. 
That that's very very true. A lot of people will do things just because it's the way it's always been done, and it fits in with the tribe. And that's not always the right way to think about things. Yep. And last question is: What is a health hack or life hack that you want to share? Find one habit that you have to do every day related to an something related to like physical exercise. So, fifty push-ups, fifty squat, whatever it is that takes and you may have to try 20 things before somehow it becomes like your identity and your habit but if i had to do one life hack i would do that because that generally leads to like oh now that i did my 50 push-ups i'll do a few other things so yeah. i try to really pound that into my patients you know i will simple. give you some inspiration on that i had just had a patient this week who he is a vet he's 80 years old he does 125 push-ups every day and 50 pull-ups he's 80 and he's still doing it, he's in his whole life. And I was like, you're shaming me. Like you are double my age, more than double my yeah. age. And you are literally doing this every day. And think about the benefits. He's living 80. And if you're 80 and healthy and fit and f can do physical things, you've got the world at your hand, in, like in, your, in the palm of your hand. But I would say the majority of patients, at least the majority of people that I see in my office, they're exactly the opposite. That's probably half the reason why they're there. And it's such a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Not now, but when you're 80, being healthy and fit is huge compared to not being healthy and fit. Well, like you said, start now. Start today. Yes. So where can people find you, Chol? If you just type in my name, C-H-O-L-L-K-I-M, I bet you'll see my YouTube channel mm -hmm. and my website. Yeah, and he also has an Instagram. Um, the YouTube is great for learning about surgery, and um, you've just got a great personality, so it's just fun to watch. And uh, and certainly Instagram is great as well. Um, so yes, thank you so much. It's been an honor having you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on the Rena Malik MD Podcast. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to check us out on YouTube or give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This allows our content to reach more and more individuals, and I'll appreciate it so much. If you want to learn more from me, make sure to follow my handle on other social media platforms, including Instagram, X, TikTok, and more. And as always, remember to take care of yourself because you are worth it.